Okay, your background is in English, um, and uh, apparently you went quite far in your education in English and then teaching, and now you're a writer and you write science fiction. Um, how did you decide, uh, uh, or why, as a person so interested in, in English, uh, do you write in the genre of science fiction? Well, the truth is that I, I have wanted to be a writer since I was in about the eighth grade, and I did not necessarily want to be a science fiction writer. I wanted to be just a writer. Uh, the reason that I'm doing science fiction now, or have done primarily science fiction, is that uh, I was first successful in submitting stories that had a fantastic or a science fictional element, and in having them sell. The other stories, the mainstream stories that I wrote, received primarily rejection slips early on. And uh, as I've said before, I'm kind of like uh, the rat in the experimental cage who goes to the lever and presses it, and when the food comes out of one particular lever, that's the one he goes back to and continues to press, and that's the way uh, I have done as far as science fiction goes to some extent. It's not that I don't care for science fiction, and I'm doing it solely because it was profitable, uh, or more profitable than the other type of writing, but uh, simply that I ended up uh, finding very uh, receptive editors in this particular field, and... Uh, that accounts for it, more or less. Does science fiction give you uh, perhaps a, a range? Uh, it's very forgiving as far as the subject matter and the way it's handled, a little more so than other genres. Is that attractive to you? Certainly, I think that's true. I think that science fiction does permit a writer to deal with just about anything that he or she wishes to deal with. Um, you can handle contemporary events by, by projecting them into the future. You can... Uh, speculate about the past, you can speculate about the distant, distant future, you can speculate about origins and ultimate ends, so that I think that really science fiction is a tremendously flexible genre, and that's one of its main attractions to me, and one of the reasons why I think I continue to write it, even though uh, I have aspirations to do other things and have done other things. Do you think, uh, or do you write for a particular audience, or do you write uh, what pleases you, and it, it uh, by by uh, happy chance uh, does uh, seem to tickle a lot of people. I think that for the most part I try to write what interests me and I hope then that it will interest somebody else. Um, I've read a number of things fairly recently which suggest that uh, uh, even though my work is very well crafted and carefully thought out that I may be uh, not reaching the audience that uh, some other writers are reaching because their work seems more readily accessible on a first look. Uh, I wish that uh, that were not the case, but I don't know how to do things any differently than I do them. Uh, I try not to be inaccessible, that's for certain, and I do feel that some of my more recent work has reached a larger audience than, than perhaps uh, the first two or three novels that I wrote. Okay, now I want to start into a line of questions uh, kind of about specific works, and the one I want to start with is A Funeral for the Eyes of Fire, which was your first novel, and that came out in 1975, and that's the first thing I read uh, of yours because I read a very good review of it right when it came out. And uh, it got award nominations, uh, but then four years later or so, you came out with Eyes of Fire, and you said that if you'd had your way, uh, the text and the title of the other one would vanish from the earth. Uh, why? Uh, uh, what made you uh, think that the first one was so bad? Well, it's not that I thought that the first one was so bad, and incidentally, it's not that, that I wanted to get rid of the title. I still like the title, A Funeral for the Eyes of Fire, much better than I like simply Eyes of Fire. Um, but my editor at uh, Pocket Books, when I rewrote the book, felt that we ought to give it a title that was new, but that at the same time reflected the fact that it was not uh, a brand new work, that I was revising an earlier work. As far as uh, my feelings about A Funeral for the Eyes of Fire go, the original novel published by Ballantyne, I just feel that I was learning my way then. That was the first time I had ever attempted anything at novel length. I had done short stories and novellas up to that point, but never anything of the length or the substance of funeral. And to me, when I go back and read the book now, I can see all of the places where I was obviously a beginning writer struggling to create a narrative and very often lapsing into... Uh, many essays of one sort or another rather than having the action proceed in a logical and really orderly fashion because of the behavior of the characters. As a consequence, uh, 
when I go back and look at it, I see my characters lecturing each other. Uh, I see gaps in the narrative. I see uh, not inconsistencies necessarily, but I just see the awkwardness of a young writer trying to handle a form with which he's not yet familiar. And I honestly feel that in the revision, uh, which Pocket Books and my editor there and I called Eyes of Fire, I honestly feel that, that there those things are, are smoothed out. I also feel that some of the uh, uh, thematic material is more carefully integrated into the narrative than it was the first time around, and that I had thought a little bit more thoroughly about that thematic material. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I prefer Eyes of Fire, I'll, the revision, that is, to the original novel, although I wish that I could have kept the original title. This book uh, has uh, something in common with uh, some of your other books in that it's... Uh to some extent, an anthropological study of these primitive aliens. Uh, it's got encounters between the shaman and technology, that sort of thing. The, the aliens were treated very shabbily. Uh, is this kind of a parable of some things that have happened in our past? Well, I'm sure that it's a, it's a parable of some of the things that have happened in our past and that continue to happen in our, our relationships to primitive peoples today. And I, I probably should put primitive in quotes because that's a term that... Uh, uh, is frowned upon in anthropological circles right now. But at any rate, I do think that it was a kind of uh, dramatic framing of situations that have taken place in the confrontation between advanced civilizations and supposedly primitive, in quotes, civilizations. And it seems to me that uh, in projecting it into a, 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 what, a setting on a distant planet, that I was just... Uh, kind of presuming that this was the sort of thing that could happen over and over again. But at the same time, really, it was a comment on, on uh, the conflict between two different approaches uh, of viewing the world. One, rather, the technological approach, and one, the rather mystical or, uh, what do you call it, the left brain side. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Well, that's the right brain, but that's I, I'm unfortunately I remember. <laughs> I'm I'm the other one. So that's uh, uh, the next novel. Then, uh, chronologically speaking, uh, is and strange to Ekbatan, the trees or Ekbatan. Uh, I had to wait till a paperback came out, and it was called Beneath the Shattered Moons. Uh, why uh, was the title changed? I'm sure that may not have been your choice. I loved the, the original title. Well, the original title, of course, is from a poem by Archibald MacLeese called You, Andrew Marvel, which itself is a, um, a kind of answer to a poem by Andrew Marvel entitled To His Coy Mistress. And both of these poems deal with, uh, what, long expanses of time and uh, mankind's really fragility and smallness in comparison to these long spans of time. At any rate, in And Strange at Ekbatan, the Trees, I was trying to show that civilizations do rise and fall. And the line from MacLeish's poem seemed to me to be apropos. Um, when the book was sold to a paperback publisher, however, Donald Wolheim at Daw Books, he did not feel that that was the uh, sort of title that was going to induce people in Kmarts and bus stations and uh, shoeshine shops uh, to pick up a copy of the paperback, and he felt that it needed a little more commercial title. He gave me the chance to uh, choose various titles, and I, I think I made a list of four or five, and Beneath the Shattered Moons was one of them, which really kind of echoes an early title by uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Under the Moons of Mars. So I felt that that was fairly commercial sounding, and it still didn't disturb me too much. Uh, replacing it for the other, although I do prefer the other title, which many people regard, incidentally, as pretentious. Okay, I want to explore um, similarity here between and Strange at Ekbatan, the trees, and uh, the short story, or, or the long short story, or whatever it is, the, the White Otters of Childhood, which is uh, by far my favorite story that you've done. Um, in both of these, you have the Parfaits, uh, and these uh, people have banished mankind to some kind of island, and there are some similarities, but one is in the 52nd century and one is in the 120th century. Uh, so I was going to ask, do these stories come from the same uh, kind of known universe? Yes, it's difficult for me to, to uh, talk about this with a great deal of authority right now because it's been so long since I've, I've uh, thought about either one of them. Uh, at the time, though, I did intend for and Strange at Ak Akbatan the Trees, pardon me, to be a kind of far future sequel to The White Honors of Childhood. 
Um, in other words, the situation in and strange deck Batan, the trees arises um, after the colonizing of a planet in another solar system um, out of the situation that prevailed on Earth as it's set forth in the story The White Honors of Childhood. Um, it's difficult for me at this point really to explain what I was going to attempt to do with those things. I do know that I considered uh, On the Street of the Serpents, uh, The White Otters of Childhood, and, 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 and Strange at Ecbatan, The Trees as a kind of trilogy, a thematic trilogy, if not necessarily a trilogy in which uh, all of the uh, uh, characters are, are related, that sort of thing. Okay, kind of the same question. Um, here, the stories blooded on Arachne and uh, the House of Compassionate Sharers seem to share uh, the same universe with stolen faces and transfigurations. Uh, is this another known uni thread of a known universe that's uh, kind of woven through your work? I think you're probably referring in particular to the fact that the aliens from one story may crop up uh, in another. Uh, the aliens from one novel may crop up in a short story. And I also use the term uh, galactic calm, I think, to describe the uh, galactic authority, which is colonizing uh, the galaxy for us. Um, yeah, this was kind of a shorthand that I used at the time in order to keep from having to invent a complete uh, uh, colonizing authority in each story. And also because I liked some of the alien creatures that I had come up with, I didn't feel that I wanted to discard them completely, so I would use them again if possible. Uh, but it wasn't really a, a uh, I don't know how to, it wasn't terribly systematic. That, that's one thing I can say about it. I wasn't planning to set uh, dozens and dozens of novels against this background, nor dozens and dozens of stories. Okay, um, the two uh, books, A Little Knowledge and Catacomb Years, uh, I want to look at them together for just a minute. Uh, Catacomb Years is a fusion, or what I call a fusion of six previously written stories and a new one. Seven, I think. Uh, yeah, right. that's right. Yeah, six old stories and a new one, and then A Little Knowledge was an original novel. Um, how did uh, how did those early short stories evolve? Did they evolve? Did, were you thinking of a series, and then uh, and then uh, you, or did you just say, hey, I can fuse these together and, uh, and make something kind of nice out of it? Well, the first uh, story that I ever wrote in that series was uh, the one called If a Flower Could Eclipse, and I wrote that without thinking that I was ever going to do another story against the same background, and that, of course, is the urban nucleus of Atlanta, the Dome City of Atlanta. Not a terribly original idea, the Dome City, but uh, when I wrote that story, it was only the second story that I had had published, and I was thinking that uh, a future city should be a Dome City, and I was trying to write science fiction of the sort, even though that particular story has a strong fantasy element as well. Um, after I wrote that, however, I, I, I guess I realized that there were possibilities for other stories, and I wrote another one, and that one was uh, The Windows in Dante's Hell, which appeared uh, in Orbit 13, I believe, Orbit, I can't remember at this point, really, one of the Orbit volumes edited by Damon Knight, and uh, at that point, I guess having written the second story, I realized that I could go on and write others against the same backdrop, with some of the same characters recurring. And that was what I ended up doing, really. It wasn't a conscious plan from the beginning, by any means. Uh, in fact, I had to do a little bit of rewriting when I went back in order to make these stories connect in, in, a, in a sensible way. Okay, you mentioned that um, this was the domed city of Atlanta and uh, that the domed cities aren't that original in science fiction. But uh, I sense, uh, when I read it, that a literal domed city uh, wasn't your first priority, that a uh, domed city gives the writer uh, a chance to talk about uh, things. Oh, uh, Atlanta was isolated, and it was kind of withdrawn. And, and if I remember right, the rest of the cities in the world weren't domed, and they were out among the stars, whereas Atlanta was just kind of all isolated. Um, and I wanted to ask you, in that vein, why Atlanta? What, uh, why did you choose Atlanta? Well, I should mention that I did... I did have it set up so that there were other cities on the North American continent that were domed. In fact, this was called a Federation of Urban Nuclei, so I think that there were supposed to be approximately 20, 25 cities, uh, and they would have included New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, all of the major cities on the North American continent, all of the major cities of the United States, I guess you could say. 
so that there was a network of dome cities. Uh, the idea here, however, was just, as you say, kind of metaphorical. Each one of the cities was its own universe, its own world. The people were withdrawn and isolated, and they practiced the kind of isolationism. In fact, in the story The Windows in Dante's Hell, the old woman, Amelia Longhope, who is found by two people uh, who are going to her apartment, really, to discover what's happened to her, uh, they find that she has created an entire world in her apartment which resembles the bridge of a starship, as from an old television program, and that she has been looking outward while her own society has been looking inward. So that was one of the things that I was trying to do with the Dome City. I wasn't interested in the Dome City as a technological marvel so much as I was uh, in a... I guess I was looking at each city as a kind of Petri dish, and I was trying to see what the human beings, the bacteria, whatever you want to call them, inside that Petri dish were going to do, how they were going to behave, and why they were behaving in the ways that they did. So it was one way of, of uh, focusing in on the human condition in, a, in an unusual way and, and in a metaphorical way. The aliens uh, from 61 Sydney. Um, were as I think aliens would probably be, which is inscrutable. But uh, but you wrote about them, so the question I'm really curious about: uh, they were looking for salvation. Uh, were they were they really looking for salvation? Uh, were they sincere? I pause because I really don't know what to tell you at this point. Um, I would say that that what I wanted to happen in that story was uh, I wanted to examine. And here I'm really going to have to stop and think because it's been a while. I wanted to examine uh, what would be the likely consequences of the conversion of an alien species to a human faith. What would be the consequences to the aliens and what would be the consequences in particular to the human beings? And I guess my reason for wanting to do that is that I've always been interested in theological matters in one way or another. And this seemed to me certainly a rather extreme theological speculation, but certainly one that has a degree of validity, especially if you believe, as I have a tendency to believe, that there is other life in the universe, that we are not the only uh, sentient creatures around, and that we are not the only sentient creatures around who are going to wonder about uh, their origins, their ultimate ends, what have you. Uh, yeah, I would say that the, the aliens were probably really genuinely looking for a variety of salvation. At the same time, they may have been trying to show that they were, despite all of their uh, inscrutable behavior, uh, companions to the human beings who had taken them in. Um, that there is a kind of brotherhood across, uh, across what the sea is space. Okay, the novel Stolen Faces, uh, this is one of those that I had trouble kind of formulating a question about because it hit me uh, more emotionally than it did logically. But it, it's, uh, it's more or less a leper colony, and uh, again, it's got this theme uh, of an exiled group uh, that's exiled because they have this disease, and uh, it's got some characters in it that really hurt and that sort of thing. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about that was, which I want to talk about some other things later, is the, is, uh, the Spanish influence. Did your experiences in Spain uh, have anything to do with this story, or did it come from something else? There were several influences on that particular story, and I would say that the Spanish influence, the fact that I I'm, I'm attended my last year of high school in Spain at an American dependent school outside of Seville, did have an influence, partly because... Uh, uh, the one foreign language that I have is Spanish. That's the one foreign language that I can deal with it with any degree of authority at all, so that helped. Uh, the other two influences on that particular book, however, were uh, a book, I can't remember the author's name at this point, but it was, a, a, it was a study of the Aztec civilization and Aztec culture. And at the same time, another book about uh, Father Damien, who was the... Uh, uh, the leper priest on Molokai, an island in the Hawaiian group. And uh, so my disease, Muformacy, as I call it in, in that particular novel, Stolen Faces, is a variety of leprosy. I say as much in the course of the novel itself, except that it can uh, uh, affect somebody even in a temperate climate or a cold climate as well as a tropical climate, uh, which is where Hansen's disease or leprosy usually strikes. The whole point of the book, really, though, was to 
uh, examine the nature of prejudice and also what prejudice itself does to, uh, to those who are discriminated against. Uh, and really, that's, uh, that was the point of inspiration for Stolen Faces. Transfigurations uh, was the next novel, and it was a continuation of uh, Death and Designation Among the Asadi. Uh, it's in the, uh, or I, I figured it was in the same, uni the same universe as Stolen Faces. Uh, right. And uh, to me, the Asadi were really alien, which again, I think real aliens would be. And this was an anthropology study, and uh, it was also, as I said, a continuation of the uh, Death and Designation. Uh, did you just, uh, that, that story, uh, you liked the background, that sort of thing. Did you always have the idea of completing it and making a novel out of it? No. <laughs> No, I, I never always had the idea. I, I think when I wrote that story back in 72 or 73 that I felt that I was pretty much finished with it, that it was complete. Um, by the time I actually undertook uh, to do Transfigurations, I had thought some more about uh, the characters in that story, both the humans and the aliens. And I had also done a great deal of reading on human origins, uh, a lot of which... Uh, I worked into the novel that followed that one, No Enemy But Time, but at, at the same time, uh, I, I guess I was really kind of laying the groundwork for No Enemy But Time with the research that I did that carried me through Transfigurations. The reason that I probably expanded uh, Transfigurations or, or Death and Designation Among the Asadi into a full-length novel that I called Transfigurations is that by that time I was a full-time writer, uh, I knew that this was one of my most popular stories, that there had been questions about it. Some of the uh, loose ends had not been tied up. And I wanted to deal with the material again. And I wanted to deal with it from, from the perspective of my new knowledge about human origins and uh, primate ethology, that sort of thing. So uh, that was one of the reasons that I went ahead, uh, used the original novella as part of the text and created uh, a good deal of more information about new characters and uh, a sequel to the original novella in the course of the novel. This is uh, one of those real obvious questions, but I have to ask it because I do want to know the answer, too. Um, in uh, Transfigurations, uh, the aliens' uh, eyes are very important. Of course, a funeral for the eyes of fire or eyes of fire. Um, just the title, it goes without saying that they are. And also, the House of Compassionate Sharers and Pinion Fall the eyes are really important. Uh, so, so it seems to me that you have kind of, not a fixation, but, but they, they obviously symbolize something. Uh, is that true? Well, I would say that the eyes certainly do symbolize something. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I want to go a whole lot further than that. I, I guess that, that it has always seemed to me that the eyes are, what's the old cliche, the windows of the soul. Uh, and for an alien species, I think they would be uh, similarly a, a means of looking into uh, the heart of the creature who, who has those eyes. Uh, I think, too, I was looking early on when I wrote the early story, Pinion Fall, which was my first story, I was looking for a way of making my aliens seem alien. And one of the ways was to describe them physically, and one of the most outstanding characteristics of um any creature, I think, are, are the eyes and how they differ from one species to another. So the aliens in Pinion Fall had eyes like insects. Uh, in uh, A Funeral for the Eyes of Fire, I guess I was again looking for a means, an exotic means of, of establishing the fact that my aliens were truly alien. And by giving them different eyes, eyes like gems, that was one way of doing that. Uh, there may have been some subliminal influence, too, from uh, one of the novels of Ursula Le Guin. Uh, trying to think now, which was a City of Illusions. I think one of her characters has very, very strange eyes. But Ursula Le Guin has been an influence on me from, from way back, and maybe that, was, that came into it to some extent, too. Uh, as far as the eyes of the Asadi go and the fact that they are a means of communication as well as a means of seeing, and also a means of feeding when you discover that they enabled these creatures to photosynthesize part of their food. Uh, I think there I was looking at the eyes in a functional sense as well as in a symbolic sense, as if they really were uh, a physical component of their makeup that could help them survive.
No Enemy But Time is also an anthropology book. She said, uh, you uh, probably on this one had to do a lot of homework, I would think, for the pre-humans. Uh, yes. Uh, I've told people that I probably did three and a half to four years of research for that book, and I believe that that's true. And by that, I don't mean that I was continuously researching and doing nothing else, not writing anything else, but only, write, uh, only researching. But I nevertheless did spend a great, great deal of time uh, reading material to, to make my proto-humans, my hominids in that book, as near to the real thing as I could imagine. Uh, so I read people like uh, Louis B. Leakey and Mary Leakey and Richard Leakey, the entire Leakey clan, Donald Johansson, uh, everything I could get my hands on in, in uh, scientific journals and news magazines that related to new discoveries in, in East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, wherever they happened to be, Ethiopia, when Donald Johansson came along. So that, yes, I spent an awful lot of time researching uh, uh, the physical nature, uh, the stature, the possible lifestyles of these hominids, but also the flora and fauna at the same period so that I could uh, make a credible stab at what, uh, what kinds of, of other animals they would encounter, uh, what kind of vegetation they would be living among, how they would have to go about their uh, survival strategies, in other words. So yes, that took me a lot of time. I found it very, very enjoyable while I was doing, and I've really kind of put it out of my mind since then. I, I, I imagine that I may come back to it later on, but I have kind of set it aside since then. That book um, I personally viewed as kind of a two-pronged, um, uh, oh, it had two facets, okay, that, that engaged me. One was the anthropology, the lore, and that sort of thing. That was fascinating. But I also really liked the protagonist. He was really engaging, uh, likable, um, and in science fiction, uh, you, especially modern science fiction, you don't often find that. But I really liked the guy. Uh, so I would assume that, uh, uh, well, I ask you, did, did he just pop in your mind, or did the does the character just form uh, gradually, and uh, that's just how he turned out eventually? I will have to say that really he formed gradually over the composition of the book. There were a number of things that uh, uh, my plot dictated. I had to have a, have a character who was somehow attuned to the distant past, and particularly the distant past of Pleistocene East Africa. And as a consequence, I came up with a character who had vivid dreams, even from his infancy on, about this particular period, so that his attunement to the Pleistocene in East Africa would make it possible later on for an Air Force uh, time program to actually send him back bodily to that period, uh, or a simulacrum of that period, as I explain it in the book. So that much I knew I was going to have to give him. After that, however, I was really kind of on my own to come up with the sort of person that he happened to be, and that unfolded for me gradually in the composition of the book, and I was kind of surprised to discover who Joshua Campa really was or the kind of character that he really was. And that was one of the nice things about writing the book, too. Did you write the book in the order that, uh, that we read it? In other words, the, uh, there, are alter there are some alternating chapters, the past, the present, the past, the present. Did you write it that way, or did you write all the past and all the present and then cut it up? Uh, to tell you the truth, I think I, I wrote... Uh, alternating chapters. Uh, there came, there were a couple of occasions when perhaps uh, uh, the episodes in the past, uh, I may have split them up and inserted a chapter from the present or from the near future, but for the most part I actually did uh, go back and forth. I did not write them in the order that they actually occur in the book, however. As a matter of fact, the first thing in the book, the prologue, I wrote at the very end after I had completed the composition of the entire novel. Uh, I might also add here that uh, David Hartwell, my editor at Timescape, was instrumental in helping me to cut down the book. It was uh, considerably longer than it is now, and it's quite a long novel anyway. Uh, and he suggested the elimination of some chapters that were really kind of peripheral to the development of Joshua Campa and also peripheral to the story of, of uh, his return to and, and his life among the early hominids. So uh, it would be difficult for me right now to reconstruct the exact order in which I wrote the individual chapters of that book, but I did uh, write some segments in the past, 
come and write some in the present and then eventually go back and uh, uh, kind of shuffle them together as if I were uh, shuffling a deck of cards. But perhaps, and at least I hope so, with a degree more, uh, not, not the same degree of randomness. I read, unfortunately I uh, wasn't there, but I read that in your uh, Nebula acceptance speech that you uh, mentioned David Hartwell a couple of times and mentioned that he had been helpful. So uh, I take it that uh, writers do appreciate it when good editors can come along and uh, uh, help them uh, see the forest, see the, the forest instead of the trees, or what, or the trees instead of the forest, whatever you're supposed to say. Well, I owe a special debt of gratitude to Hartwell. Um, I would have to go back as far as a little knowledge, for instance, because he helped me with that book. He helped me with Catacomb Years. And although he had moved over to Timescape, which then was simply a, a pocketbook, Simon & Schuster, before he came up with the Timescape logo there, uh, but he helped me also with Transfigurations. In other words, he was at Berkeley Putnam when that book was contracted for, but he moved to uh, pocketbooks before he had a chance to work on it. Nevertheless, he was he did give me some help on it, and uh, he gave me a lot of help, as I've, as I've indicated, on No Enemy But Time. I don't know whether all writers appreciate that sort of editorial help and direction, but uh, I know that I can use it upon occasion, and I think that Hartwell happens to be one of the people in the field who can give, uh, who can give intelligent help. Under Heaven's Bridge was a collaboration with Ian Watson, uh, with whom you've collaborated on uh, editing uh, some short stories, if I might remember right, since then. Um, how did the mechanics of uh, collaborating take place? And I also wanted to venture a guess that the aliens were mostly you, mostly your aliens. I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, the aliens really are my aliens because uh, uh, what Ian wanted to do, in fact, what he suggested is that I write a story about the aliens the Cygnosticoid from a little knowledge and catacomb years, but that rather than showing them in a human environment, the urban nuclei, that I take them and show them against their uh, the background of their home planet. Um, so I told him, I think I wrote him a letter, we'd been corresponding since about 1976, I believe, and I wrote him a letter and said, uh, I'm really tired of those aliens, I don't think I want to do anything else with them at all, I'm, I'm finished with them. And he wrote back at that juncture and gave me a number of interesting ideas about them and said, uh, uh, it's really too bad because there are lots of good things that we could still do with them. And at that point, we decided that maybe we could go ahead and collaborate on it. Uh, so the aliens were mine, and Ian wanted to, wanted to see what they would be like uh, on their own home world. So we sent uh, uh, an expedition, an Earth expedition, to their home planet and had them encounter those aliens there. We gave them a different name because we discovered a number of things about, uh, uh, well, the star system 61 Cygnus is not really the kind of double binary that would support the kind of life that uh, I had uh, come up with in a little knowledge and uh, catacomb years. So we had to change a few things. And so I think we call them Kybers in, uh, in uh, and under Heaven's Bridge, which uh, indicates that they are a kind of cyborg or organism, and, but but naturally so, uh, that they evolved in that fashion. And as far as the mechanics of the collaboration went, Ian sent me about 30 pages of material, which included a beginning, a middle, and an end, and suggested that we work from that as kind of an outline. I took those 30 pages and expanded them to about 100, and then we simply worked on... Uh, interpolating new chapters uh, in that material. I believe Ian wrote the prologue to the book as well. Uh, and I, I had final control over the, over the entire manuscript just to make sure that the style was fairly consistent throughout. Okay, I want to get off now um, and ask a couple of questions about uh, poetry and how it relates to your work. Uh, White Otters of Childhood which I said a while ago was my favorite story. Uh, the hero was uh, Mark Cryer Rains, and he's a poet. And uh, he, talks a, he talks a lot about poetry in the story, and he quotes poetry. And he said, uh, there's a quote I remember one time where he said, you can't write poetry when your spirit is submerged. Uh, so uh, I wanted to kind of delve into that. Is that you talking? Uh, because you, you do write poetry, and there must be some of you in him. And is that true? Is that the way a poet works? Oh, golly. I think I, I probably ought to acknowledge a, 
a debt here to Roger Zelazny in particular. I don't know whether you know, you must know, his early story arose from Ecclesiastes, which has as its protagonist a poet. And that story of his, I believe, well, it is, it's my favorite story of his. Uh, and I think I was probably working with that story in mind when I wrote uh, The White Otters of Childhood. I'll also have to say that uh, I had read recently, uh, by that I mean before I began writing The White Otters, I had read uh, the poetry of St. John Peirce, who is a French poet, was a French poet. He was a diplomat who also wrote poetry. And he has a long poem called Sea Marks. Uh, and some of the lines in that particular poem suggested the title of the White Otters of Childhood to me, and also the nature of the protagonist, also the nature of the, um, of the mood that I tried to evoke in the story. Uh, I don't think anybody has really paid much attention to that or even noticed it, even though I think I quote from him uh, at the head of one of the sections of the story. I use an epigraph of his at the head of one of the sections. Uh, as far as it being impossible to write poetry when the spirit is submerged. Is that what I said? That's what you said. Okay, I would I would say that that's probably true. Uh, that disturbs me a little bit because I find that lately I've written less and less poetry. Uh, I'm not sure that my spirit is submerged so much as I am that uh, uh, poetry does not put food on the table, whereas uh, prose can sometimes do that. So I have written a lot more prose lately than I have poetry, although I still like poetry and would like to be able to write more. What I need to do is ask you a short answer question and then flip my tape, and I have two more after that. Okay, good. Uh, okay, uh, so I'll reverse the order because I wanted to ask the other one first, but I'll ask it. Uh, uh, is science fiction poetry viable? Because uh, you have written some science fictional poetry as well. Uh, I have down here the rhyme between... Uh, Betelgeuse and Proust, and for the lady of a physicist, I was kind of tickled by that rhyme. <laughs> but uh, is science fiction poetry, is that just a gimmick that people can use and, and get uh, in a magazine? Or is that, do you think that's something that's real and, and maybe will become more important? Well, I've always felt that it was possible to write poetry about anything, so that it seems to me entirely possible and viable and uh, legitimate to write poetry about uh, speculative subjects. Or, or subjects that uh, use science in one way or another. Uh, whether it's a gimmick on the part of the people who are writing it to get into the magazines, I have no idea. I'm sure that the science fiction magazines could not pub publish any other type of poetry, however, uh, but poetry that deals with a speculative subject or with, the, uh, with science in some way or another. I want to get back to the White Otters of Childhood uh, to with the ending. And uh, I have the quotes here. I'm not a very good dramatic reader, so I won't, dr I won't read them dramatically. But the quote is, at the end, I'm convinced that we are the freaks of the universe. We were never meant to be. And then it goes on a little further and says, we're an improper balance of stardust and dross, too much of one, not enough of the other. Uh, that's, that's an interesting summation, uh, kind of uh, pessimistic, although I pretty much agree with it. Uh, is that uh, kind of your personal philosophy? I would have to say that it may have been my personal philosophy at the time, although really, legitimately, you would have to attribute it to the protagonist, uh, Mark Cryer Raines, who happens also to be the narrator. Uh, I would say that, no, it's not my particular philosophy any longer, and that's partly because I, I, I think that there may be some significance behind everything, and uh, I'm continually in the process of looking for it. A story of yours that uh, was in a rather different vein was Rogue Tomato. Uh, again, the obvious question, uh, the protagonist's name was Philip K. Uh, Philip spelled with one L. Is this, uh, by any coincidence, uh, uh, related to Philip K. Dick? Oh, it's no coincidence. <laughs> I probably ought to say, however, that uh, some people have seemed to, to think that uh, the story embodied a criticism of Philip K. Dick in some way, or a criticism of Kafka. I think what it principally embodied a criticism of, or a satire of, was um, stories that, uh, uh, what, perhaps had too open or mystical an ending, stories that uh, uh, used the word rogue in the title, for one thing. I can think of a great number of science fiction stories which use the word rogue in the title. Uh, and I tried to think of something that I could conjoin with that word that would be uh, 
just completely ludicrous, and so I came up with a rogue tomato. Okay, um, are you working on anything now? Do you have plans? Uh, what do we have to look forward to uh, from you in the future? No, I was hoping you would ask. Uh, first of all, I have a short story, a second short story collection coming out from Arkham House with an introduction by Tom Dish, Thomas Dish, uh, and that collection is entitled One Winter in Eden, and whereas my previous Arkham House and Pocket Books collection was called Blooded on Arachne and consisted primarily of science fiction stories. Uh, one Winter in Eden will consist of borderline mainstream stories, fantasies of one sort or another. Um, I really feel that it's a stronger collection than, than the first one. Uh, in addition to that, Arkham House will be publishing in later on in 1984 a novel of mine entitled Who Made Stevie Cry? And that last word is spelled C-R-Y-E because cry is a surname. Uh, and it happens to be a send-up of horror novels, um, which is a complete departure for me. And I had a good time writing that particular book as well. I don't know how it's going to be received because uh, a number of publishers have not known exactly how to, or, or did not know exactly what to make of it, how to market it. Uh, because although it has some elements of a horror novel, it also very distinctly has uh, parodic or, or satirical elements. Uh, in addition to that, I'll be working on a novel this year uh, uh, for tour books for David Hartwell, who has who will be working there on a freelance basis uh, with this particular novel of mine. It's going to be uh, uh, an expansion, not really an expansion, a continuation of a novella of mine published recently in Terry Carr's Universe 13 called Her Habilene Husband. And I think that the entire book will be called Her Habilene Husband as well. And it reverses the situation in No Enemy But Time by bringing uh, a proto-human or a hominid into the present day rather than by sending a contemporary human being back into Pleistocene East Africa. You generally think of Arkham House, gee, that was H.P. Lovecraft's publisher and that sort of thing. How did you uh, get... Uh Tied up with them since uh, I can't think of any other science fiction writer. I could, I'm probably wrong, but right there. Uh, Arkham House is changing directions to some extent, and I don't think it's making everybody who is an Arkham House book collector entirely happy. But I do think that it's doing a great deal. Forgive me to improve the quality of some of the work that comes out from Arkham House, and this is a result of the editor there now, a man by the name of James, to me, Jim Turner. Uh, I think along with David Hartwell, Jim Turner is one of the one of the most astute and helpful editors working in the science fiction field today. And he originally started out, of course, editing uh, for Arkham House novels and stories in the Lovecraftian mold. Uh, I think he has moved away from that in part because he 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 finds it difficult to to continue or to maintain an interest in that kind of fiction over a long period of time. Uh, he sees that there is some interesting work being done in the science fiction field as well as in the horror field. And uh, he's interested in experimenting a little bit with, uh, with hardcover publication of short stories that might not have otherwise had hardcover publication uh, because they had appeared originally in science fiction magazines or that sort of thing. But uh, my connection to Arkham House really right now is dependent upon uh, the fact that Jim Turner likes my work a great deal and has been very helpful. <laughs>